And hello, everyone, both here and online. We have uh, looks like about 38 people joining us online, in addition to everyone else in the room here. Uh, so before we, we kick off today uh, some presentations, I thought we'd do a few quick introductions. Not everybody, but I did want to call out a few people uh, who are here today. Um, first, I know uh, Lori Cargill. <laughs> Good timing. Uh, she has got a little booth out there if you want to say a few words about what you're doing here. I am the Mason and Lake County 4-H program coordinator. And this summer we'll be doing some programming with youth in both counties. Um, it's called Project Fish. There's a whole curriculum. We've got all sorts of supplies and really neat activities to do with kids. I just need adult volunteers to help me out. So if any of you are interested in volunteering to teach kids how to tie knots, how to put something on a hook, how to catch something with that hook, come see me afterwards and we can talk about what that looks like. <laughs> so, if you, and folks online, if you couldn't hear, because we didn't have a mic ready just yet, uh, Lori is with Project Fish and based here out of Mason County. So if you are local and you're online and interested in volunteering for helping kids uh, get out fishing with Project Fish, uh, contact Lori at the MSU Extension Office here at West Shore Community College. Uh, also, I want to call out Mark Tonello. <laughs> Surprise. Hi, Mark Tonello is with uh, Michigan DNR. Uh, you want to just uh, let us know a little bit about your, your job and responsibilities in case people have questions specific to you in your area? Sure. Yeah, I'm a fisheries management biologist for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. I work out of the Cadillac office. I cover this area like I have for 20 plus years, obviously, a lot of familiar faces in the room. So glad to see everybody here. Great, thanks. And uh, most of you virtually or in person met Caitlin, who's holding the mic here and helping us facilitate, which we really appreciate that, along with Geneva's help online. And uh, we had a little meet and greet before. I wasn't in the room, so I didn't get to participate. But I also want to introduce uh, a couple other people who are online. And let me see, Geneva. <laughs> this is why we have the remote help. That's great. So uh, I'm with Michigan Sea Grant, and I know a lot of you I've known for years. I've been doing this. This is, I believe, my 17th uh, Ludington Regional Fishery Workshop. And obviously, this is the first one in a few years we've had in person. So it's great to see folks here and get the online experience as well. Um, but for those of you who don't know me and what Sea Grant does, uh, we're, we got people stationed all over the state. We cover all the coastal counties and really we do a lot inland too, but uh, we're broken up into these districts. I'm the Southwest District Extension Educator. So I cover seven counties from Mason down to the state line. And we have uh, extension educators in all these districts around the state. And we also have uh, research and communications programs as part of Michigan Sea Grant that go through the U of M uh, offices we have. So we, we involve both MSU and U of M. It's quite a, a partnership. And today we have uh, our new director, Sylvia Newell, uh, started on as our Sea Grant director uh, out of our U of M office last year. And uh, Sylvia, if you're on, if you just want to say hi and a few words about your role here. Absolutely. Yes, um, I'm new to Michigan Secret as a director, and I'm also a professor at University of Michigan. And I am really learning a lot about fish because my research area has been in harmful algal blooms. So I focus more on the water quality and sort of the, the bottom up control for what makes a lake ecosystem healthy. But I'm learning a lot more about this and gotten sort of jumped into the deep end of the pool thinking about perch walleye and whitefish in particular in my own work. So I'm super excited to be learning more from all of you today. Thanks, Sylvia. And you know, that brings up a great point. We have all these different people with all these different areas of expertise in Sea Grant. So we're not all fish people. In fact, most of us aren't fish people. And that's part of our strength. We deal with all kinds of different Great Lakes issues and obviously harmful algal blooms on Lake Erie, especially. And a lot of our inland lakes too, even here in West Michigan, has been a huge issue. So uh, it's great to have you on board, Sylvia. And uh, I'll also introduce Heather Treisenberg. And I know a lot of you here have worked with uh, Chuck Pistis, who was my predecessor, and also Heather's predecessor, because Chuck started out as the Southwest District Extension guy, which is what I am, and then wound up being our Extension Program Leader. 
And Heather Treisenberg is now our Extension Program Leader and also the Associate Director for Michigan Sea Grant. So she's out of the East Lansing office on the uh, MSU side of things. So Heather, do you have a minute to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your focus? Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's great to meet you. Um, I, I know I've met a few people before and, and there's new um, uh, partners and attendees and, and stakeholders that we work with that I look forward to meeting um, and learning more about in the future. Um, I've been with uh, Michigan Sega and MSU Extension for about a decade now, um, and I, I do a lot of behind the scenes work um, to support Dan and uh, the other extension educators that serve these coastal counties here and work with our MSU Extension, kind of our broader network and, and leadership. Um, my background is in human dimensions of natural resources, communication planning. Um, <clears throat> so I really like to try to understand how people interact with the environment, um, what they do when they have conflict, um, and uh, and try to help try to help um, identify productive ways forward and collaborative ways forward in um, in our, our natural resources management. And um, it's a joy to work with Dan and his colleagues and Caitlin and I know Mark's online tonight here um, and I, I think that we have um, a lot of uh, really great programs that we've offered over the years and with your input and with your suggestions and with your um, kind of role in being a thought partner we can um, really help to um, you know modify make sure that we're delivering um, and working with you on providing the science-based information that you want access to and that we want to help to facilitate so um, that's a little bit about my background and um, what I do. I just want to say it's great working with Sylvia, where our, some of you have heard earlier, we are a very long-standing partnership between the University of Michigan and Michigan State University. We're really proud of the collaboration, the blue-green collaboration that we've had over the years, and um, we look forward to continuing to fulfill our mission, um, our SEGAT mission in uh, the Great Lakes region. So thanks for the opportunity to join you virtually. Uh, I hope you have a good program tonight. Uh, I'm happy to uh, respond to any questions or emails or phone calls. And I know um, I, I think Sylvia would also be glad to hear from you as well. Uh, but thanks, Dan, Caitlin, for putting together a great program tonight. Thanks to our guests who are joining. And uh, thank you for showing up either in person or virtually uh, to learn about uh, our Great Lakes fishery and Lake Michigan in particular. Thanks, Heather. And uh mentioning human dimensions focus that's uh, so important when it comes to fish and wildlife management uh, I don't know how many different fisheries biologists and professors I had that said you know when it comes to fisheries management fish do a pretty good job of managing themselves it's a lot of times more about the people so I think uh, in my role here uh, even though I'm trained as a uh, you know population, biologist. Uh, a lot of what I've been doing for Michigan Sea Grant involves more of the, the public input and survey work and lately citizen science projects. So I'll take a few minutes to update you on some of the citizen science work that I've been involved with over the, the past few years. And uh, the big one lately has been the Michigan River Steelhead Program, which uh, utilizes a, a series of, of apps we, we call the Great Lakes Angler Diary. We have an Android and a Apple app that uh, you can get for that or just our website. And this goes back to uh, Salmon Ambassadors program that we had uh, running from about 2014 to 2017. And I know a lot of you guys participated in that. It was on the, the big lake really focused on Chinook salmon. And uh, as the mass marking program switched its emphasis kind of from marking all the, the Chinook salmon to marking all steelhead with code of wire tags beginning in about 2018. Uh, we also switched focus and it was a chance to reach out to more of a, a different audience of, of river anglers as too. too. So uh, we changed the way we do things a little bit and it's been pretty successful. Uh, it happened right uh, around 2020 when we launched. So guess what? We wound up doing everything virtual the first year, but because our rivers and our river fishermen are so spread out, uh, it actually worked out really well to engage people. And we had regular Zoom uh, calls where everyone gets together and gives fishing reports and updates on science. So it's been uh, pretty successful. We've had three years so far and we've learned a lot. And we, we look, of course, at the stocked fish and I say stock, but really 
I always have to be careful because we we can't say 100% sure if the fish are stocked or not because they're although all the fish stocked in Michigan since 2018 have been clipped with an adipose fin clip and or possibly a ventral fin clip um other states Indiana Wisconsin and Illinois did not mark a lot of the fish that they stocked in 2021 so uh, there are some some unmarked fish still out there. But the bottom line is that, you know, we've we've learned a lot about how both the marked and unmarked fish are contributing differently to different rivers all over the state. And it's really hard to even draw quick general conclusions for an update like this. But I'll encourage you, if you're interested in learning more, we have hours and hours of much more detailed presentations online at our resource page there. And again, we we offer Zooms a couple times a year to, to give updates to folks who do sign up. So it's very similar to the Salmon Ambassadors program. Uh, for those of you who participated in that, the key is that we ask people to record data on all steelhead fishing trips, even if you get a skunk, uh, record it as a day of fishing and measure every steelhead caught and check for fin clips. And the reason that's so important is because when you get to citizen science, if someone catches a big steelhead that's wild, they might say, oh, wow, this is really interesting. I'm going to report this one. And then they don't report the smaller ones they catch that that have fin clips. So that really biases all the data. The whole point here is that we are making sure that we get really, really good quality data. And we're pretty sure that, that what we get is, is very good because we take a lot of pains to make sure that it is. One of the things, uh, we there are problems with these kinds of angler diary programs over time because a lot of people get excited at first and then there's a lot of attrition. People kind of fall off. And we see that with all uh, these uh, types of citizen science programs. But uh, when we compare it to Salmon Ambassadors, Salmon Ambassadors, we we promoted it workshops like these and we had really good response the first year. Uh, that's the orange line there. But it really tailed off. We kind of plateaued quickly with our number of volunteers. And through reaching out online and uh, also some partnerships with outdoor writers and uh, Fish Fray YouTube channel was actually a huge source of uh, recruitment for us online. We've we've continually grown our number of volunteers and also managed to grow our number of catch data sets over the years. So uh, all this is to say, you know, if you're if you haven't signed up yet, we're still recruiting people. We're still interested in more data. And in fact, uh, even if you don't wind up completing your data collection for the year, which is, of course, really important and nice. We also do a survey at the end of the year. So we also really want to hear from people who didn't necessarily follow through with the data collection. We'd still love to get a survey from you just on general thoughts on the status of the steelhead fishery. So uh, if you're at all interested and if you want to receive our uh, updates uh, as the time goes on, please do sign up. And we got some additional material out on the table here for folks who are in in the room. One thing I want to point out with the steelhead is that uh, we know there was this missing year class in Michigan. Uh, steelhead were not stocked as yearlings, as most are, in 2021 because eggs were not taken in 2020. Well, what that means is those fish this year right now, which would be the fourth year of our project, those fish would be uh, lake age three. And lake age three fish are the bulk of the fish that return to our rivers. So of all the years, this is the year that we will see the biggest impact from that missing smolt cohort, which means that things should really improve over the next couple of years, hopefully pretty dramatically, because that those age three fish can be over 50% of the run. So we're probably looking at about half as many stocked fish as we should have out there this year. So that's really important to keep in mind. And I think I've, I've talked to some of you on the side. We have a lot more details at, at the stuff online, but we've also had really good conditions for steelhead in rivers over the last couple of years. We had a really mild summer, which means less extreme hot water temperatures that impact young steelhead in the river. We also had really mild winters the last couple of winters, which is also good for survival of young steelhead that might be wild reproduced. So we could be seeing an upswing, you know, don't want to promise too much, but hopefully we'll see some improvements there and hopefully we'll pick it up in this project. A couple of uh, graphs to show you with the data. Again, we've had over 7,000 fish over the first three years and we're now in our fourth year. If you're not used to looking at these like frequency data, 
uh, graphs. Um, the, the blue here, the dark blue is clipped fish, so probably stocked. The light blue is unclipped, probably wild steelhead. And what you see is during year one, we saw kind of an equal distribution of the, the clipped and unclipped fish. And you see circled in red there, the impact of that missing smoke cohort. In our second year, those fish should have been age one. So they should have been returning as skippers. And you see no dark blue lines in those 15 to 20 inch fish. So you can see very clearly, and this is exactly why we ask everyone to measure every fish. Because if we just had fin clip data, we wouldn't ever see this. They'd all be lumped together. And what we see is in year three, which would have been last fishing season over the fall and winter and spring, uh, we saw where that 2021 smoke court cohort should have been is in those age, uh, uh, like uh, length 20 to 28 inch fish. There's a lot of overlap there though. As they get older, it's a lot harder to tease out what the impact of that missing cohort is. But what you do see is that the next smoke cohort, th those fish were right back where they should be. You see the dark blue lines, the survival of those uh, stocked fish contributing about equally to what the wild fish did in terms of that year class. So it'll be really interesting to see as time goes on this year, those fish would be in that, you know, what we think of as a good quality steel had your normal, you know, 27 to 30 inch kind of uh, mature fish. Those are the fish that are probably missing this year from that a missing stock cohort. So again, we, we've tried to combat attrition a bit, a few different ways. One of the ways is we do have uh, some prize drawings for our June survey now. We definitely uh, link this to recording complete data. So if you can com complete your data and, and, and turn it in at the end of the year with the survey that certifies it's complete, then we'll enter you in a drawing for gift certificate. And again, this year, it, it's not for sure yet, but we're hoping to offer additional drawings for people who don't even collect complete data because we really want to get more opinions from a broader uh, selection of people. And what we've seen is we do know that we have some bias in our data to extremely avid river steelhead anglers who tend to catch and release a lot of fish. And we were able to compare that with the DNR's statewide steelhead survey of uh, license holders. So we know we can we can measure that bias. So we really want to make sure we count more of the folks who do tend to keep fish and maybe don't fish as often because their opinions are just as important. So another uh, initiative that more of you guys may have been involved in is collecting data for uh, Brian Roth's uh, Huron, Michigan diet study. I know this group, uh, going back to probably 2018, 2019, uh, Dr. Brian Roth from MSU was here talking about this effort. Stomach collection began in 2015. Think about what a massive effort this has been to collect stomachs of all predator fish in Lake Huron and Lake Michigan since 2015. And of course, there were some gaps in, in 2020, not just because of the pandemic, but also that was a gap in, in funding. Uh, for the program, but there was another grant, a Great Lakes Fishery Trust grant uh, that kicked in for 2023 and 2024. So additional work is being done now and uh, we're welcoming all the stomachs we can get. I do want to say a few things because I know some people who collected stomachs got a little frustrated because um, again, just like me with my, science, uh, my citizen science program, uh, Dr. Ross' lab is very particular about making sure they get good quality specimens. So for a while, he was saying, if the if the stomach is cut open, we won't accept it. We won't look at it because something might be missing. And he was also very specific about only taking the stomach and not taking anything that might be in the intestines or taking any other part of the gut tract. So those guidelines have been relaxed a bit because we do want to encourage people to participate. And we know that people like to squeeze the stomach and look to see what's in there before they put it in the bag. So before we were being sticklers about that, not so much anymore, but do make sure you have everything that's in the stomach. Like if a fish has a partially regurgitated AOI or something, make sure that gets into the bag. Uh, as much food as you can. And if you do put the intestine and other things in there, that's fine. What happened though, um, we, what we saw is most of the stomachs that have been returned have been from agency collections from Fish and Wildlife Biotechs and, and Creel clerks with DNR and others. Um, and Lake Huron anglers have really donated a lot more stomachs just on their own, keeping them in the freezer and putting them in a freezer drop site than Lake Michigan anglers. 
We'd love to see some more returns from Lake Michigan anglers. And I think the reason for this is probably that Lake Huron's had all the problems with the food web and people are very keyed in on that. And, you know, they have a, a lot of different fish. They have the, they're less likely to just catch a bunch of Chinooks all the time. And frankly, we don't necessarily need just a bunch of Chinooks from everybody. We, we kind of know what they eat and we get plenty of them. So this year, I really want to stress collection of the uncommon fish like brown trout and steelhead is really, really the important thing. And again, we do have a slightly streamlined process here. Um, one of the things we have is you see the, the picture there of the knife punching a, a little punch tag. We have those available here or you can print them online. And this makes it so you don't have to get your pen all bloody when you're cleaning fish. You can just take your knife and poke the data <laughs> that applies to your fish. So what is important is that you don't bias it, obviously. Don't just, if you catch a big fat brown trout and a skinny brown trout on the same day, take both the stomachs. Don't just take the fat one because those zeros are super important too. But uh, again, really stress looking for the brown trout, the steelhead, because we got really low returns on those, especially the browns. And I'll point this out because I looked at this uh, before the South Haven workshop last year. And I noticed that for brown trout in 2021, there's so much green here, right? And guess what? Green, that light green is alewife. So surprise, almost everything eats a lot of alewife in Lake Michigan in most years. But the brown trout this year had this huge contribution of rainbow smell. So I, I checked with Brian and he looked in his database and he's like, oh, that's pretty much all from one fish because most of the brown trout we caught didn't really have much in them, and there were so few. It turns out that's the only brown trout I've ever caught out of my boat, and I took the stomach, and it was full of smell. So it just goes to show that if you're out catching a handful of brown trout this spring, your fish could make a huge impact in our understanding of what brown trout eat. So please be on the lookout for them and, and grab some bags. We got free bags here and free tags if you want them. Uh, all you have to do is freeze them and then put them in a drop site when the freezers are at the drop site a little later this year. So I'm um, going to get through the next slides a little, little quick here. I uh, just wanted to point out that there's lots of new findings from uh, Dr. Ross' study. Obviously, this has been going on for years, so he's continuing uh, analyzing all the data from all the past years. We've kind of seen again and again, yeah, we know a lot. Lake Michigan fish eat a lot of alewife, but there's more to it than that. And one of the things that was in a new analysis he pre presented at the American Fishery Society meeting last year was that the proportion of empty stomachs has been generally going down for most species in Lake Michigan. So that's a good thing. More fish have something in their stomach. And that's where those zeros are super important too, right? Because we're seeing less zeros, which means fish are finding more to eat. He also did an analysis of the ration or the amount of food, the weight of the food in an individual stomach. And that has been increasing for certain species like uh, coho and steelhead as well. Uh, with steelhead, we saw a lot of invertebrates, especially the first year of the study, which isn't necessarily a good thing. People tend to think, oh, well, steelhead, they, they can just eat bugs if there's nothing else. But you don't grow near as well if you're eating bugs. Uh, you get a lot more bang for your buck when there's a lot of fish out there to eat. So seeing less invertebrates in later years is actually a positive thing. So I wanted to point this out because uh, we have uh, Brian joining us on May 1st for an online only workshop along with a couple other people you're probably used to seeing at these workshops, like uh, Matt Cornis with the uh, Great Lakes Mass Marking Program and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So he'll be talking about tag returns. Obviously, they've got a lot on steelhead, chinook, lake trout going back several years. We'll also be hearing from uh, new fisheries division uh, chief Randy Claremont with DNR talking about departmental priorities on May 1st. So that'll be a really great discussion. And we'll have an update on uh, lamprey control. So again, that's kind of a Lake Huron and Lake Michigan joint workshop with a lot of the information because with a shorter format here, we can only cram in so much and uh, we don't have the, the all day uh, format on a Saturday like we used to. So thanks a lot.